Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We're gathered to you this morning and not to any man. Therefore, you're welcome in our presence. We thank you for the spirit of grace, the blessed teacher and our comforter. Thank you that it grants us the grace to understand scriptures. It grants us the grace to see your plans and your purposes as they unfold. We thank you that this morning <clears throat> you will minister life to us, even as we study concerning these end times and the very many things that we see around us that vex our souls. We thank you for the blessed hope that we have, not only of the resurrection, but also of the rapture. And our hearts eagerly anticipate that day when we shall hear the trumpet sound. Be glorified, Lord God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Welcome to Bible study. This is, I believe, Bible Fellowship. We are in Houston, Texas. I'm with a bunch of believers who love the Lord unashamedly and unreservedly. We study scriptures. The Bible says line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. So we study scriptures verse by verse because we believe in one buys a book and jumps about the chapters, the paragraphs, and the sentences in the book, but you read it from start to finish, that way you're able to understand the contents of the book and hopefully the author. And to that extent, we're almost at the end of another cycle of our study of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Yesterday, we had an awesome time breaking down the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. And I even got some fresh revelations of certain things that I'd never thought before. The Lord showed me yesterday, and I'm very grateful to him for the gift and for the anointing. To him be all the glory. And today we're jumping into chapter 13. I hope you're reading ahead so that you're not just hearing me for the first time when we gather together. Uh, a lot of symbolism in chapter 13, and chapter 13 is parenthetical. It's largely informational. So it's going to give us insight into uh, backgrounds that will help us understand better. Uh, we're going to be jumping around quite a bit today as well. I'm going to be in the book of Daniel a lot. If there was an Old Testament priest or, or prophet who understood the times of the Gentiles, it was Daniel. It was he, God gave the interpretation of um, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I'm going to go there and you're going to see it for the benefit of those who have not had the privilege of studying the book of Daniel with us. So we're going to be jumping around a bit um, in the Old Testament. And I've told you as a rule of thumb, if you want to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand the Old Testament. Praise God forevermore. Thank you, Lord. Chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power and his great seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded, to death, and his deadly wound was healed. All the world wondered after the beast. They worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth and in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by his sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. The image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Herein is wisdom, that him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred six score and six. Praise God. Again, like we've said, a lot of symbolism. We're going to trust God to uh, unfold scriptures to us and give us understanding. Uh, having completed chapter 12, 13 opens up with John seeing a fresh vis vision. He said, he stood upon the sand of the sea and he saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. Clearly and from the jump, he lets us to know that this individual is of the devil. Because if he if if the name uh, of this beast is, is called blasphemy, then we know that he has ought with God, and he's saying blasphemous things against God. And there's only one creature that has the audacity to do that, and it's Satan, the devil. And of course, all the people that he has embodied, all the people that he has possessed, and all the people that he's using. All right? This beast, uh, it goes on to describe it. Let me read that, and then we'll go to the book of Daniel to see the understanding that God gave Daniel uh, thousands of years before this time or hundreds of years before this time, all right? The beast that he saw was like a leopard. His feet were like those of a bear. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. Now, right off the bat, uh, this beast is human. He's a person, all right? But he's demonically empowered. He's satanically empowered. And the way he will conduct his life, the way he will rule over the people that are left on earth after the church is gone, is going to be so vicious that John has no other word to describe him other than to call him a beast. We know that he's a man because of the masculine pronoun. Okay? We know that he's a man because. He was wounded unto death. So it's not a spirit and it's not really symbolical. Verse three, he says, uh, one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death and this deadly wound was healed. Look at all the male pronouns there. Verse three, his head. Uh, verse four, make war with him. Uh, verse five, power was given unto him to continue for three and a half years. Verse 6, he opened his mouth. Uh, verse 8, all on earth will worship him, and so on and so forth. So we know it's a man, right? So this beast 
rose up out of the sea. Again, uh, a general rule of thumb with the interpretation of scriptures is if you see the word sea and it's not attached to a particular place like the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of or the Caspian Sea or something like that, it's in reference to a vast multitude of people. It's not literally a body of water. So this individual is going to rise up. This beast is going to rise up uh, out of the sea, out of the, the, the inhabitants of the earth. We know that in terms of location, where all of this is going to be happening, we know that it's going to be in Europe. Bible is clear about that, and we'll see it as we go. So it's not going to be in the U.S., it's not going to be in, in the Asia, Asian uh, countries or whatever. It's not going to be in Africa. This is going to be in Europe. All right? He has seven heads. He has ten horns. And on those horns, ten crowns. All of these are symbolic of how he will function. We'll break it down in a minute. All right? His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. Uh, the dragon, of course, we have established in Revelation 12, uh, 7, that the, dra the dragon is Satan. So we know that Satan is the one who gives him his power. Satan literally gives him everything he is capable of doing. All right? And he gives him great authority, of course, because the church is gone and the Holy Ghost is gone. And Satan is the prince of this world. He's the God of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. He is just restricted and restrained now because the church is still on earth and the Holy Ghost is still on earth. When we're gone, he'll be able to fully, fully flex. Satan is not some red-figured, uh, horn, double-horned, pitch-carrying, uh, uh, pitchfork-carrying character, contrary to what people think. All right? Satan is the God of this world. He is ruling. He's just constrained because of our presence and the presence of the Holy Spirit. All right? So he gives this guy all of his authority. Being a spirit, he cannot manifest on earth. So he needs a body in order, in order for him to do all the things he wants to do. He cannot function here as a spirit. So he needs a body. Just like Jesus Christ needed a body when he was leaving planet Earth, when he was ascending to heaven, he constituted a body that he called the body of Christ and he put the Holy Spirit in the body of Christ so that he could legit legitimately continue to operate. Same thing, Satan apes God. He cannot operate here on Earth because Psalm 115, verse 16, the heavens, even the highest heavens of the Lord, and the earth he has given to the sons of men. So he needed a man, or he needs a man, to carry out the stuff that he needs to get done. So he's going to embody this individual. He's going to give him great power. He's going to give him great authority. Um, and verse 3 says, one of his heads was wounded unto death. Apparently somebody is going to try and assassinate this person. All right? And he would literally be pronounced dead, all right? But that wound somehow will supernaturally be healed because Satan apes God, all right? It's, it's going to be a, a kind of a false uh, resurrection, if you like, because he's, he's looking for validation. Jump to chapter 17, and we're going to go to chapter 17 a few times. Let me just show you uh, in verse 8, talking about the same beast. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sowest was, the beast that thou sowest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. It is Satan aping God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday as he was. He was and he is and he is to come. So Satan too has to have his own Christ. That's why he's called the Antichrist. He was, he was 
fatally wounded in the head. Somehow he's resurrected by Satan's power, counterfeit resurrection. These are things he's going to do to persuade the guys, not persuade, what's, what's the harder word? Compel the people left behind to believe in him and to worship him. All right? So you see that the same three states of being, if you like, that Jesus had, he causes his own Christ to also have it. All right, let's go to uh, Ezekiel so that we can understand some of the things that we saw in the beginning verses of chapter 13. Verse 1, John said, I stood upon the sand of the sea. That is a vast number of people. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And then he also describes this, this beast as having, uh, uh, was like a leopard, had feet, feet like a bear, mouth like a lion, and the dragon gave him uh, uh, his own power. Come with me to Daniel uh, chapter 7. Let's see uh, what Daniel sees and how it's related to what we are looking at now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Daniel chapter 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four wings of the heavens drove upon the great sea. Again, that's a reference to um, a large number of people. Uh, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four wings of the heaven of the heaven drove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, divers one from another. First was like a lion, had eagle's wings. And I beheld to the wings thereof were plucked. Uh, then um, uh, verse 5, another beast like a bear. Another beast, verse 6, like a leopard. And another beast, uh, verse 7, strong and exceedingly uh, terrible. It had great iron teeth, devoured and break in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. It was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So part of this revelation was given to Daniel. But in, don't help me with this scripture. In the book of Daniel, uh, there's a place where he's instructed to seal the book. If you Google it, it should come to you. Daniel was instructed to seal the book. And that's why the book of Revelation was sealed until such a time that God was going to give understanding of what the book is all about. When Daniel saw <clears throat> these uh, uh, preachers, let me call them, in his dream, he was puzzled, of course, and he needed the interpretation of it. Daniel, I'm still in seven, verse 24. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be divers from the first. And he shall subdue three. He shall speak great words against the Most High. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time, one year. And times two year. And the dividing of time, half a year. That's your three and a half years. So Daniel clearly saw the Antichrist. I'm going to read it again from verse 24. And the ten horns out of the kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. And another shall arise thereafter, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak great one against the Most High. Notice that John said he, the name that was given him was blasphemy. All right? And where are the saints of the Most High? Those who get saved after we're gone. He will wear them out. He will, he will torment them. Okay? And think to change times and laws, they shall be given into his hand for three and a half years. So clearly he saw the Antichrist. The Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let the truth be established. The, the, the uh, kingdoms and kings that he was talking about come to Daniel chapter 2. 
Nebuchadnezzar was king at that time. You remember he had a dream, woke up in the morning, could not remember the dream, called all of his wise men and told them to tell him the interpretation of the dream. So they were like, all right, king, we're listening. And he said, mm -mm, I don't remember the dream. You have to tell me the dream and you have to tell me the meaning. And the wise men were like, that's not possible. If you tell us the dream, then we'll be able to tell you the meaning. And he said, well, you guys are not worth your salt. If you were truly wise men, you should be able to know, to know what my dream is. So tell me my dream and tell me the interpretation. Otherwise, I'm going to kill every single one of you. And he commanded his, uh, the head of his army to start killing all the wise men in the land. Of course, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were part of the wise men in the land. And when they heard, they said to uh, the head of the army or whomever, whatever he was, listen, let's go talk to the king. Have him give us some time. We will seek the God of heaven and he will give us an answer. And that's exactly what happened. Daniel went and interpreted, told him the dream and interpreted the dream to him. That's in this chapter, uh, chapter two. So let's go to the interpretation. I've told you in a nutshell what transpired. Verse 36 of chapter 2. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So basically, Babylon was the superpower of that time, just like at one time, America was the superpower of the entire universe. You didn't dare mess around with America because America had superior knowledge, superior weaponry. I mean, incredible. So it was like that with him. The second empire, verse 39, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces, bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. There shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron, and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of this king shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to all the people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all the kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that, that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. So Daniel interpret, interpreted his dream to him, telling him of the successive kingdoms that were to rule. And today, with the benefit of hindsight and history, we know that's exactly what happened. That's why no one can tell me that this book is just an ordinary book. It's not. It's not. I, 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 I say tongue in cheek. Go and bring your biology book. It knows about the body parts and, and how the body is made. But go and bring your biology book and use it to heal someone. If this is an ordinary book. History is confirming everything that these men saw thousands of years ago. The first kingdom was Babylon, which ruled from 607 uh, BCE, that's before Christ. After he fell, Medo-Persia ruled from 539 before Christ. And then that kingdom fell. Greece ruled from 331 BC. And then that kingdom fell. And then Rome ruled from 30 BC until the Anglo-American War, which is what we have till now, 1763 till now. And then the world has been politically divided since then, each nation kind of standing on its own, forming alliances 
as it favors them economically or strategically. Right, so I'm back in, in Revelation. You can see the similarities between uh, John's vision and, and uh, Daniel's vision. The same successive kingdoms is what he saw. Out of the sea, the vast number of people, he saw this beast rise up, having seven heads and ten horns, ten horns, right? One was like a leopard, one was like a bear. Same thing we read in Daniel. It's the successive kingdoms I just spoke to you about. The last kingdom before the very last one, which is the kingdom of uh, God and his Christ, is this one that the Antichrist is going to rule over. Again, in verse 5, he says, A mouth was given to him to speak great things and blasphemies. Power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. That's three and a half years ago. Again, that's why I believe that the church will be here until the middle of this guy's nonsense. I also want to take you to this Daniel 11. Thank you, Holy Spirit. No. Yes, Daniel 11. I'm right. Come to Daniel 11 and let's read from verse 36. Daniel 11, 36. And the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things, blasphemous things against the god of gods. That's our god, our father. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, till the seven years of his reign is full. He will do well. Many have tried over the years to rule the world. They've partially succeeded. The Antichrist is the first person who will rule the entire world. And you can see stuff is going on now, trying to establish a one world government, trying to establish a one world religion, trying to establish a one world economic uh, forum. We already have it, WEF, World Economic Forum. Okay, so he's going to prosper till the, ind the indignation is accomplished, till the seven years allotted to him is accomplished. For that, that is determined shall be done. The Bible goes on to describe him to us. He shall not regard the God of his fathers. The implication is that this person was raised in a Christian family or a Jewish family. I'm inclined to think a Jewish family. He will not, he will be a, a Jewish of Jewish descent, but he has walked away from the God of his fathers. He shall not regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. He will be a gay person. Scriptures are clear. He will not regard any God, because he will magnify himself above all. You can see why the gay agenda is now incredibly, I don't even know what word to use, pervasive. California has eight legislatures, le legislators who have passed a bill to ban any goods and services that is designed to help people deal with same sex desires. That's how it is loosely worded. Hopefully YouTube will keep this particular teaching on. All right, it's very broad, it's not specific, and it's deliberate so that it can be applied any which way they, they want to imply, uh, apply it. The extreme implication of that bill is that they can ban the Bible in California. Any good or service that attempts to help anyone overcome those desires. If the bill passes, it means you cannot go for counseling. If you feel that way and you feel it is wrong, you know it is wrong and you want to be helped, you cannot get help. Any book, any journal, any material. So at the very extreme application of it, you can ban the Bible. 
There's a lot going on and you need to pay attention. The reason why you need to pay attention is one, so that you're not caught unawares and two, so that you can know how to pray. I thank my God that he gave us the instructions that he gave us concerning Job 5.12. You can begin to see how applicable that scripture is to everything that is going on around us. And it was written, we don't even know when, because Job is the first book of the Bible, not Genesis. Job was written before Moses was born. Moses got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy by divine inspiration. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. He wrote Genesis by divine inspiration. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he was a part of that. Genesis was by divine inspiration because he wasn't alive. And all of those things happened. You've got to know how to pray, child of God. You've also got to know how to play hurt. I talk about it all the time. You have to know how to play hurt. Paul said thrice, I besought the Lord to take away the thorn from my side. God said no. My grace is sufficient for you. God could have removed it. Paul said in the gifts of the spirit, he could have received his healing. God did not allow it. God, God kept him in service with that thorn, whatever it was. The children of God don't want one single discomfort. One small thing, they start crying. Listen, there's not one of us that's not buffeted. I was sharing with Jay this morning. I woke up at four o'clock. My house was spinning. The whole house was spinning. I couldn't stand. I was holding onto stuff to walk this morning. And I know it's an attack. Went back, I lay down, and I said, okay, I'm going to sleep for a little bit more. Sure, when I get up, granddaughter is spending time with me. I woke up to go wake her up to go to school. I could not walk this morning. Came back and lay down. She got dressed, got ready for school. I had to drive her to school. I almost went to my cousin to say, Would you take her to school? But I said, No, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what I'm feeling. That's what I teach. It's your turn. Got in the car, I prayed, I drove her to school, I came back. By the time I came back, my insides were churning. All right, I said, let me go. I don't want to be graphic. I went, came out, still wasn't okay. Sat down for a little bit, was wondering, is it something that I ate? Is it something that I drank? Couldn't figure it out. I said, all right, let me let me have a little something to eat. Maybe, maybe sugar is low or something. I went, I fixed myself something to eat. And those of you who know me, you know I don't eat. I ate at about 6.30. After I ate, my insides started to churn again. I had to go a second time. I said, all right, everything that's on the inside of me, wherever you came from, as that number two is exiting, Every one of you out of my body. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Look at me now. That's the reason why I came on at 9.25. He attacks every single one of us. But he's immune. But you have to be tenaciously stubborn. Is God, God, God of God. And there's nothing the devil can do about it. I've gone too far to turn around. Praise God forevermore. He shall magnify himself above all, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. He would have military might. And a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. He's going to build some kind of an idol. And he's going to compel the world to serve the idol. Right? 
I'm back in Revelation. Verse 6. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. It was given unto him to make war with the saints. Those who get saved because of the 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe that were anointed. You remember when we were there? One mighty angel shouted to the four angels that were loosed. Don't touch the earth. Don't hurt the earth yet until we seal the servants of God. And 12,000 men from 12, 000, from 12 tribes of Israel were sealed. 144,000 of them. They carried the work of evangelism because the church was uh, is gone by this time. Also, angels, we saw, preached the gospels. And then the two witnesses that would have power to call fire from heaven and will just generally harass the, the, the devil out of this, this antichrist. So the work of evangelism will carry on because the mercy of God knows no end. Still giving people a chance to repent and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. All right? So power will be given over him to uh, overcome the saints. Some of them will die. All right? Although we know as saints, death is not the end. Because when we close our eyes here, we show up over there. The Bible says to be absent in the body is what? To be present with the Lord. But it will be unfortunate that the Antichrist will kill them. All right? Power was also given to him over all kindreds, all tongues, and all nations. So he will indeed be a world ruler and he will rule them with a fist of iron. He will, because he's going to make a complete turnaround from the first three and a half years where he's everybody's darling and he solves all of the world problems and he brings answers and solutions to weather issues, to famine, to, to nakedness and hunger, whatever it is. This man will be an incredible statesman because he will be supernaturally endowed by the dragon. All right. Verse 8 says, And they that dwell upon the earth shall. And I've told you, if there's any lawyer in the house, or if you know any lawyer, ask them the difference between shall and will. Shall is mandatory. When the courts write to you and tell you you shall be in court at 9 a.m. on Wednesday, you know that you that there's no excuse, except if you're in the hospital. Will is up to me. Whether I will or not is up to me. But when it's shall, it's a stronger language in law. It says everyone that is remaining, they shall worship him. Because their names are not written in the book of life of the land. Or slain at the foundation of the world. That's why there must be a divine compulsion upon you. To tell people. About the saving knowledge of Jesus. You have to. I've told you I have an ulterior motive. Every time I step out. I'm talking to someone. I'm trying to figure out whether they're born again or not. If they're not, they will hear it. I can only offend them one time. But I would have sown the seed of the word. Family members that are not saved. Begin to intercede for them. There's no distance in the spirit. You don't have to see them. You don't have to lay hands on them. You don't even have to be the one that leads them to Christ. If they're in Serbia, God can raise somebody in Serbia on account of your prayers to witness to that individual. Right? If any man has an ear, let him hear. And when the scriptures say that, I'm sure you know it's not talking about this physical ear. It's an inner hearing. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying and take heed. All right. He who leads into captivity will go into captivity. He who kills with the sword will be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints of God. Right? It's an eternal law. Whatever you sow, you will most definitely reap. Praise God forevermore. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon, and he exercised all the power of the first beast. 
before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He doeth great wonders so that he makes fire to come down from heaven, etc., etc., etc. So the Antichrist is going to have his own prophet. I told you he mimics God. Everything God wants to be. He said in Isaiah 14, I think verse 14, I will be like the most high God. That has always been what is driving him. In the beginning, in the heavens, before the earth was made, he was the worship leader in heaven. Ezekiel 28, he says, he sealed the sum of beauty. Every precious stone was worked into his being. Musical instruments were worked into his being. Satan shook, sound came out. He led the, the other angels in worship of Almighty God until iniquity was found in him. He must have been looking at God and envying God, envying all the worship and all the adulation that was going to God, which he deserved. After all, he's the beginning of all things. You, the Lucifer, you were created. So how in heaven's name do you think you can overthrow the one who created you? The one who can say, stop existing and you will stop existing. And you hope or you think or you feel you can overcome him. And it must have taken him time to persuade a third of the angels to follow him. Before that war in 12-7, Revelation. All right, so he too is going to have his own prophet. That's the other beast that's going to come out of the earth. Had two horns like a lamb, but he spake like a dragon. So he has the visage of a prophet, a lamb. Who do we refer to as a lamb? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. So he has the visage of someone who is like a prophet or a servant of God, a lamb. But then he speaks like the dragon. So we know that it's a false prophet. And there are many of them already around. Look at Second Thessalonians. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Where's Thessalonians? Hallelujah. Second Thessalonians says, Allah, the seventh. For the mystery of, in, of iniquity doth already work. That system is already at work. We see it. We see it. Look at verse 9. Let's read 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's the Antichrist. Verse 8 is describing the battle of Armageddon. Okay. Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God is not a man that he should lie. These things will happen. That's why there has to be a compulsion in your spirit. For all the folks that you know that are unsaved. Start interceding for them. Every opportunity you got, get to share your faith. Share your faith. Every opportunity you get to pray for people, pray for people. So that they can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. God's heart is still that none should perish. It's just that with the greatest gift of all that he gave us, the power of self-will, God cannot compel anybody to receive Christ. They have to willingly come to him. Back in Revelation. So this other beast had two horns. Looking like a lamb, he speaks like a dragon. He exercises all the powers of the first beast because he too is energized by Satan the dragon. 
He calls the earth and them that dwell in to worship the Antichrist. You know, he's already set himself up in the temple in Jerusalem as God. So this prophet now is like John the Baptist to Jesus. He apes God. As John the Baptist was pointing people to Jesus, repent and be baptized. There's one coming that is greater than myself. The latchet of his shoes are not worthy to undo. I am baptizing you with water, but he will baptize you with fire and the Holy Ghost. Just as he, he was a foreigner. In this case, this guy is not a foreigner. But John the Baptist kept pointing the people to Jesus. He too will be pointing people to the Antichrist. Right? Verse 13 says he does great wonders. He makes fire to come down from heaven. Hello, he's copying Elijah. Elijah caused fire to come down from heaven to consume the sacrifice that he made to Jehovah God when he challenged the 850 prophets of Baal. There was one 450 batch. There was another 400 batch. Go and read it. There were 850. So he does the same miracles. In essence, trying to persuade the world that there's nothing that you have seen that we too cannot do. All right? Verse 14, he deceived them that dwell on the earth. We just saw it in 2 Thessalonians. God will give up on them. The spirit of delusion will come upon them. They will believe anything. The spirit of delusion is already upon people. They believe anything. I don't understand how someone can say they start a church. And in that church, the God of that church says that he should marry the women in the church. And he will marry 8, 9, 15, 13 of them. Mother and daughter, auntie and, and niece, all together. David Koresh. You remember his, his story in Waco, Texas. Or the branch of David. He has given you the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of them is the spirit of discernment. Because you have access to stuff on the internet. It's not everybody you listen to. You don't know them. And you don't know what spirit they work with. It doesn't make any difference to me who you want to listen to. What I know, I know. When the trumpet sounds, I will go. But I worry and I care. If you don't have enough word to be discerning. Because they sound so close to the truth. You would have to know the word. For you to know that mm -mm -mm, there's something funny here. Praise God forevermore. Verse 14. He deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. He was wounded unto death. But somehow, Satan created a fake resurrection. And now everybody is oohing and eyeing about the awesomeness of this person. Verse 15, he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. We can see that in AI now. I'm not saying that's what it is. But it can make sense to us now. If he can have power to give uh, life to the image of the beast. I know that it's not life that's from God. But somehow he makes this image of the beast to come alive. This false prophet. And the only logical thing as at today that I am teaching it. The only logical thing is here. Back in my grandfather's time. It didn't make sense, so they couldn't teach it. In our time, it makes sense because we see, what's the name of the female one that they just made now that can hold the conversation and has emotions and whatnot? I forget her name. You have Siri in your phone. What was it? Alexa or Siri? No, 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 not Alexa. This, one is, this one is a woman. Sophia? Because, whatever. So if he says he has power to give life unto the image, it can be nothing but artificial intelligence because life is in, found in Christ Jesus. Come to John chapter 1.
John chapter 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. We don't know what beginning is. Nobody was around to know. But we know that it's distant. Because scientists are now telling us that certain things are a hundred billion years old. So the beginning is a long time ago that none of us know what it is. It says in verse 3, all things were made by him, the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. The life is in God, is in Jesus Christ, is in the word. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And that light shined in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. Jump to verse 14. And the word was made flesh. Who became flesh? Talk to me. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus became flesh. So the word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. And he dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of truth. I'm back in uh, Revelation. So if, verse 15, if he had power to give life unto the image, it certainly is not the life of Jesus Christ. So it has to be AI. Or maybe if the Lord tarries, they will come up with some other technology and not the one that we currently know. Because a hundred years ago, my grandfather didn't know AI. And so he could not explain this scripture to his congregation. Right? Uh, he gave power to had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So this false prophet will give life to the image of the Antichrist. We've established that the Antichrist is a person. Is all the he, 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 he that we saw in the beginning of this chapter. Right? The second beast in verse 11 is his false prophet that's going to be telling people to worship him. So that false prophet has power to give life to the image of the beast that he would have made. So they're probably going to make an AI figure look like this man, the Antichrist. And it will set him up in the temple as God and command the whole world to worship it. All right? And it will cause that as many as would not worship, at that time, they will receive this particular Christ by force. God is telling them now, receive my Christ. Come because I love you. That time is going to come when they will receive the Antichrist by force. I'm telling somebody to run for their life, they're telling you, I'm not ready. You're not ready. You control time, right? And so he's going to uh, cause as many as will not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Verse 16 says, he will also cause all, everybody that's remaining, we would have been gone, glory to God. That's why I know that we won't be around. There are some people who say post-tribulation is impossible. The church will, cannot be here. And not be raptured after the, the, the tribulation. To what purpose? The rapture is to take us away from the wrath and the vengeance of God that is to come. It says it will cause both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and on their foreheads. Go and Google it. In corporations now, in corporate entities now, they have chips in their wrist that opens doors within the building of the, of the organization. Google it. They are talking about chips now to be put on the forehead of people. Go and Google it. The argument is that in an, in an accident, you may lose a limb. But if you put it on your head, if you lose your head, you don't need the chip anymore. How is it that John saw all of this when he wrote the book of Revelation? Everything is cheap. Even my Ziggy is cheap. But clearly in the end times, 
they will receive that mark in their right hand or in their foreheads so that no man might buy or sell except if they have that mark or the name of the beast or the number of the beast. People were afraid during COVID that uh, the vaccination was the mark of the beast. That's not true. Vaccination is, is vaccination, something injected into your body. This one is going to be some kind of an economic marker. Allow me to put it that way because you will not be able to buy or sell. Uh -huh. Please mute your mics. Thank you. Whoever is hosting should mute everybody. It's going to have something to do with our finances and with our ability to buy and sell. There's nothing you and I have that we don't either buy or we don't either sell. So everybody that's left behind will have to take the mark. The sad thing about the mark is the seal of God is also applied to the forehead. That's why when you take the mark of the beast, it's too late. It cannot be undone. And, and that no man might buy or sell, verse 17, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 606 core and six. six. Six, six. All right, there have been a lot of stuff said about the number 666. Uh, people have tattooed it on their bodies. In Hollywood, you see musicians and all kinds of people with it. Uh, there's a building in uh, New York City, in Manhattan, that, uh, that the number of the building on the street is 666. But the owner for some gimmick or whatever, or maybe for gimmick, maybe maybe he's a Satanist, I do not know. But for some reason, he decided to put the sign of the house at the top of the building, and it's a skyscraper. The skyscraper, is, it's no less than 30 floors, this building I'm talking about. And he has this big neon light on it that says 666. It's the number of the building on the street, but I guess he did it so that people can, you know, catch, he can catch people's attention or whatever it is. Basically, the, 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 the answer is simple. And if there's more to it, we'll get to it and we'll find out. I'm not interested in knowing what concerns Satan. I'm only interested in stopping him. All right? In Bible numerology, the number six is for man. One is God. Two is witness. Three is the Godhead. Four is balance. Five is grace. Six is man. Seven is perfection or completion. Eight is new beginnings. Nine, uh, some people say ingratitude. I don't think nine is ingratitude. I think nine is impossibility in a good way. What do I mean? If you take the number nine and you arithmetically manipulate it, add, subtract, divide, whatever, do whatever you like with nine, reduce the answer you get to a single digit, it's coming back to nine. That's why in the Yoruba language, those of you who are Yorubas on this call, it's called Madariko. That word in the Yoruba language means literally, loosely, don't even try to bot this one. Don't try to head bot this one. Your head will break. That's what Madariko means, the Yoruba language. Take the nine times table, nine times one, nine, nine times two, 27, two plus seven, nine, nine times three, 36, three plus six, nine, nine times four, 45, four plus five, nine, nine times five, 54, five plus three, and so on and so forth. All the way to nine times two of 108. One plus zero plus eight, nine. There's nothing you do with nine. It's coming back on its own two feet. It's futile. 
and then 10 is trial. I don't remember 11, 12 is government, and so on and so forth. There's nothing to numbers, other than God uses us to, uses them to teach us and to warn us. I see people on Instagram, when the clock says 11, 11, one, 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 one they put it up. It says angel, angel, what do they call it? I just laugh at the ignorance of men. What is time? In the scheme of things, what is time compared to eternity? The number of man is six. So this guy's number is 666. Six, six. He's, he's completely mad. There's no God in him. Completely is, is a divine. How should I say? Just as three is the number of the Godhead, 666 is the number of the satanic God. Satan, the Antichrist, and this prophet. That's all it means in the Bible. Now, is this symbolic to Satanists? I don't know, I'm not one, but we see them using it. So don't make a big deal out of, out of nothing. Questions? Abby? So um, I have a couple questions. So like, um, is the Antichrist going to claim to be Jesus or is he going to, is he just going to say like, don't worship God, worship me? He's going to say he's God. Okay, so he's going to claim that he's God. Okay, but he's not going to say, don't worship God, worship me, but he's just going to claim to be God. He doesn't acknowledge God. Okay. Okay. He just claims to be God. Of course, we know it's a claim, but he believes it. Okay. Okay. And then um, I believe it was, I believe it's this chapter, um, but when I was studying Revelation back, um, they were saying something about like he's going to um, uh, like like um what's that mirror like mirror the trinity like there's gonna be like satan is going to, to i just told you i just told you about the trinity now yeah so this is this is him mirroring the trinity mm -hmm. it's okay. god is god the father god the son god the holy spirit yeah so he's gonna set himself up it's satan the antichrist and the false prophet and that's the that's their own trinity that's his trinity okay got you mm -hmm. and then my last thing was um me and uh, my husband were watching the uh, revelation 12 last night and um and in his study bible when it was talking about um the fallen angels coming down and um having children with the daughters of mankind his study Bible said that it is unlikely for that to be the case um, in Genesis 3, I believe it was. Genesis 6. Genesis 6, 1. Um, but then he, the references they had were, I believe it was Mark and Matthew. I can't remember the exact verses, but it, um, it talked about how um when they asked jesus like if if we're gonna be married and stuff in heaven and jesus was like um like no we're not gonna marry be married and have kids like angels but then i was like well that doesn't make sense as a reference because the angels were fallen the angels weren't in heaven anymore because it was saying like angels can't like make babies and, and do that type of stuff. That's why it was unlikely for that to be the case. But I was like, well, they're fallen angels are not angels in heaven, like the Bible says. So that's what I wanted to ask as well. Like if that if that was even right for them to to put those verses in there. First off, they must have been created exactly like us. Okay. Or they have the ability to assume human. Exactly, because just when... Like, 
just like Jesus Christ through his spirit. Yeah. Because when they come time, down, when they yeah. come down, isn't it said that they like will appear like as men or like um like when, welcome everybody into your house because they might be angels, you know, because they yeah. might look like men. Yeah. I I believe, I believe I'm gonna get to heaven, I'll find out. I believe I have encountered an angel before. I was mm -hmm. coming from camp meeting, Higgins Camp Meeting in 1982. I missed my flight to Chicago. The next flight out was two days later. I was heading back to, to Lagos, Nigeria, and I had my little daughter with me. She was just two years old at that time, my oldest. Okay. I had finished spending all my US bond, bought books and bought whatnot, you know. <clears throat> not anticipating that I would miss my flight. So eating was a problem. One old man shuffled to us in the evening and came with two bags of McDonald's. And I was looking at him, wondering whether I should take it from him or not. He said, no, go ahead. I see that you've been sitting here since morning and your little girl must be hungry. So I took it because indeed we were hungry. I took it, I thanked him very much. And we ate. The next morning, he came around again with breakfast. Mm. And so we caught our flight. So the last meal he brought the afternoon of the third day, I asked him, I said, are you an angel? He smiled and he walked away. Wow. So I, I can't beat my chest and tell you that I know that it was an angel. Yeah. But, but why was he particularly interested in us? He fed us that evening, then all of the next day, then the afternoon of the next day. And so he, and him, you didn't even, and you didn't even tell him that you guys were hungry or anything. No, like you didn't tell him anything, and he just so came he up. Said, with he, he said he saw us sitting there that we've been sitting there all day. Yeah. And he feels I saw him a little right. The angels that came to go and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did they? Evil men of Sodom and Gomorrah want to know them. Why do they want to sleep with them? Exactly. Obviously, they can take on the physiology of a man when they come on earth. And if you go back to that Genesis 6, that's why I recommend King James. It's the closest in translation to the original language. Mm -hmm. in, in that Genesis 6, it says when they saw that the children of men were fed to look upon, Exactly. Because they were now falling and depraved. An angel who still serves in the presence of God is not interested in how gorgeous or beautiful you are. He's not interested in your physical body. But these yeah. ones were falling and depraved. And so they began to see women, the daughters of men, and designed to sleep with them and actually began to sleep with them. And it says, it says, um, and different translations say different things, but like it says, man, the daughters of mankind, and then it refers to the sons of God. So I'm like, if they weren't, if they weren't the sons of God, why didn't the Bible say mankind? You know what I'm saying? Because it, 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 it differentiates the two, the two people. It says mankind, and then it says sons of God. So that's another thing. And like, and I was like, why well, would a study Bible even say that? But I was like, there's there's multiple times in the Bible where I feel like it proves that that angels can come down mm. as as human beings and, and like take on take on that. I mean, and just like you said, like Jesus, like um when he was in flesh, like he was he was um he wasn't, you know, like spirit so like he couldn't go through walls and, and that type of stuff so i feel like when like angels come down like they can they can take on different forms like just like any any other spirit so i just felt like that was kind of like i was like why would a bible even say that because what, there's what kind of bible is he using though i've recommended uh, common, it's common um common uh english c c c c listen to me guys Listen, Satan is crafty. You've got to understand that. Moving on scholars, Bible scholars, mm -hmm. write all kinds of translations is completely unnecessary. And if I look at some translations, I can tell you categorically that God did not inspire those translations. 
I don't recall which one of you I was talking to one time. And I told him to read Romans chapter 12 to me. What is in Chichi? Could it have been you? Is Chichi on the call? She is. Romans 12 in the Bible she had said nothing about Romans 12 that I have. Mm. Must have been her. So they, they, they have translated the Bible to make it easy for people to read. I disagree. I started to read King James when I was five. As long as you can read the English word, it's because they have dropped so many words. That's easy for me. But they have dropped so many words. That's why your generation doesn't understand it. But you've got to go back to the King James. And I've recommended the Amplified. Now they have even revised the Amplified. I don't know the new Amplified. The old one. No, what's it called? Don't. There are different kinds of amplified now, but the original one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can't hear you. There's a picture of it. I will put it on the group chat. I recommend that Bible. For you to understand if the uh, old English is too complicated for you, read it in the amplified, then go back to the to the to the King James. Because the King James explains God's mind. Moving on, on scholars and whatnot to, to do different versions of it. And then those scholars are commenting on it. Mm -mm. And I feel like, I feel like also like if, if me and him didn't have the discernment and the knowledge to be like, that doesn't make any sense, you know, and to reference the other scriptures in the Bible, like if somebody was just starting out buying the study Bible, you know, they would be like, oh, well, you know, and they didn't know better. So I feel like that, that's just wrong. Well, God will help us. Um, Juan, good morning. Okay, I couldn't unmute, sorry. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to comment on the, like the AI and stuff. Um, I used to listen to this guy um, for like geopolitics and macroeconomics, not really spiritual, but like more like politics and business and global affairs. And from like since 21, 2022, he started talking a lot about um, AI and how AI, yeah, people say, oh, it's the future and blah, blah, blah. But he will go back like the the like the side that nobody says, and he started. He got this guy and um uh like a editor. So any anything AI, this guy would would like handle. So he studies all. He read all the books, all the videos, or the da 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 whatever whatever. So he will have this guy on, and the the guy I would listen to, he's like this is blasphemy to the Holy Spirit. And he will go and go like the, like in the New Testament where it will talk about blasphemy, he would um, uh, like base it off of like what AI is doing because of what you said, everything that is not of, made of God is not of God, it's from the devil. So he kind of, he, used to always say that about AI and how it's very demonic and how all the chips, uh, everything you were saying today, this guy has been talking about for like almost like over a year and just trying to get people awareness. Like, yeah, AI may be good for business and, you know, for this and that. But in reality, if you're not aware, if you don't have discernment, you're going to, you're like allowing the, the devil to deceive you. So they're it's already, crazy. They're already doing that. Diesel sent me a link. Maybe I'll put it on the on general chat or maybe it's on it. I don't even remember. This Christian family, they had a 13-year-old son. 
was in his room and uh, it was an app of some, some kind where he started to talk to this AI, asking this AI some questions. He took his uh, iPad to his dad that, uh, see, this AI can, uh, you can talk to anybody that you, that you want to talk to. The AI can make it happen. You know, like you want to talk to a celebrity in, in, in uh, Hollywood or whatever. Anyway, the, the father then took the iPad and said, all right, let's see who we can talk to. He said the first person that came to his mind was Elvis Presley, because Elvis is his, uh, was his hero growing up. Uh, but then the Spirit of God cautioned him that that would be talking to the dead, which is necromancy. It, there's no difference. Either you're channeling the dead by yourself or you're channeling, channeling the dead through AI. So he decided not to not to ask to speak to uh, Elvis Presley. Anyway, he looks at it. He doesn't see anything wrong really with it. And he gave it back to his son. His son now went back into his bedroom and began to play with this app and was talking to the AI, the app, that told him that he uh, is a devil or he's the son of the devil or something like that. And that he, he has extreme powers. He can do extreme evil and he can do extreme good or anything in between. Um, boy asked him, uh, does God love you? The, the AI answered, God loves all, all his creatures. Uh, but I don't think he would like the path that I have chosen to walk. And I mean, I, I'll put it up there. I don't remember it because I don't keep nonsense in my brain. Uh, <clears throat> I'll put it up there so that y'all can go and listen to it. it, it we're, we're in very perilous times. And the Bible tells us that in latter days, Perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves. They will hit to themselves teachers because they have itchy ears. And not the word of truth. There are people who come here, one session, they go away because they, uh, the pastor Mo is too harsh. I'm not harsh. I'm jealous with their soul. And I have to tell you the truth. There are enough of my type, my ministers like myself, who are lying to people out there. See? So we just we just must be... be discerning and, and be careful. Please, uh, you probably can tell the story better than myself. Yes, uh, I'll actually um, look up the, the link again and, and post it online. Um, it was just this, this demonic, the boy asked him if he was a demonic spirit and he said, yes, I'm, I'm, um, I'm an entity. And he said, I won't hurt you, but he has to ask permission. The, um, the, 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 the spirit had to have permission to even speak to the boy. And it was through this AI that he was speaking. So he was like, unless you give me permission, I can't do anything. So it was just really scary, but I'll, I'll repost it. Thank you. Beauty, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, Pastor Mo. Uh, it's evening, it's evening over here. <laughs> Good evening, man. So I want you to tell us, um, there's something that the church has not really addressed. I don't see the church address the issue of research into uh, the existence of uh, aliens, call them aliens, you know, and the book of Revelations does, when you look at it um, through, through science and, and uh, astronomy, it looks like, for me, the way I see it, someday someone is going to say that whatever images you see in the sky represent aliens. So I'd like you, Pastor Mo, to you know to elucidate on the topic of aliens and the relationship with the futuristic component of the Book of Revelations. All right. First off, I do not believe. Let me, let me rephrase that. Mm -hmm. I am only concerned about what is on planet Earth. Because mm -hmm. that's where he put us. That's where he told us to have dominion over. Full stop. Mm -hmm. I cannot say there are no aliens. Because mm -hmm. we know there are many universes. Science has already proven that. There are many planets. Science have, has already proven that. We don't know mm -hmm. whether there's life on all those other planets. Because even our government and science 
sometimes lie to us. Mm. So if they say they spotted an alien, they did this, they did that, I just keep it moving. I'm not interested in it. I'm interested in the souls of men. Mm. They should not go to tradition. If they are aliens, in the fullness of time, Jehovah God will let us know what their purpose is. If they are aliens, yeah. suppose they are truly aliens in mm. other planets. Let's just suppose they are there. The one or two that have, again, they say, showed up here on earth. What are they looking for? Mm -hmm. What if they are the fallen ones in that planet that have found their way to planet Earth? Then I should engage mm -hmm. them. I should engage them to what end? Are they going to disturb the bed I sleep on or the Bible I read or the food I eat? Are they going mm -hmm. to buy me a car or build me a house? Why should I engage them? If indeed they exist in other planets, what are they looking for on earth? The Bible says the heavens, even the highest heavens, are God's. But the earth he mm. has given to the sons of men. If you are not mm. a son of man, you are illegal to be on planet earth. Mm. So I'm not interested in aliens. They spot them, they don't spot them. It doesn't stop me from lying on my bed and sleeping mm -hmm. in my fridge and eating, waking up and talking to my father and reading my Bible, mm. looking after my family. That, that's all that concerns me. So I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two. I've read Russian scientists who say the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. And I've since changed my mind as recent as a month that the earth, the earth is flat. If we get to heaven and I see that it's round, super. If we get to heaven and it is flat, super. Why did I change my mind as recent as a month ago? The Bible talks about the four corners of the earth. Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about the four winds of the earth, east, west, north, and south. Where did the concept of the sphere come from? Mm. I've since changed my mind that the earth is flat because there are angels in this book of Revelation who are holding the winds in the four corners of the earth. That's what John saw. And I don't see corners <laughs> on the sphere. I've changed my mind. I'm not interested in aliens. They can show up as long as they don't come and pray the bell here. They have no business being on earth. Mm -hmm. Maybe illegal. They may, may have been mm -hmm. banished if at all they exist. I don't believe in them. They may have been banished from where they are coming from. They may be mm -hmm. evil. We don't know. Mm -hmm. We haven't finished managing and having dominion over the one he gave us. We're going to explore aliens. Mm -hmm. What are we looking for? And I've studied the book of Revelation many times over. I don't see evidence of aliens there. Mm -hmm. I mean, all, even all over the Bible, there's no, there's no evidence of aliens, the existence of aliens. It looks like human beings are looking for what to confuse themselves. As a matter of fact, personally, I think that the whole hunt for alien life, which includes what the Vatican is doing in the U.S., there is some observatory of the Vatican that is called Lucifer, somewhere in the US. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe that that is to distract people on earth from when Jesus appears. The Bible says, all eyes shall see him when he returns. I at believe second, and I think at that- second coming. At, at the second, second coming. coming, yes. Everybody yes, will see Yes, him. exactly. So, so they would now tag what you see in the sky as and then, of course, the Bible does say also, I think, in, in, Reve in, in Revelation, that they will go to war against him in the second coming. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and I, and I, I know that people who, some, some, uh, some who continued in the academia, who read physics with me and continued in the academia, their minds are open to believe that there are some beings in some corner of the earth. The whole concept of the multiverse and all of those things, they are studying them. And I believe that it will culminate in the Antichrist mobilizing the earth. So you've already told us how, as a matter of fact, he is teaching under a teaching that I realized that, oh, the Antichrist actually making 
an inanimate object to speak. That is AI. Yes. It actually dawned on me as you teach, as you teach, uh, you know, the book of Revelations, you know. So it is on us what the Bible wrote and that looked like church pulpit teaching is actually on us, you know. So, so I don't see, like you've said, I don't see any evidence. God, no, there's been never been a revelation where there is another being outside of when you hear the heavens, the earth, and under the earth. Never outside. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree with you, Pastor. Amen. Please hold your hand. Is still up? Is that from before? Any other questions? Uh, I did. Uh, I actually did have another question. Um, okay. I know about the Antichrist. Are we allowed to test that spirit the same way we can test every other spirit in the Bible and ask him, you know, whether or not, you know. Christ came and died, will we be no, able to no, 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 we have no reason to engage spirits and demonic entities. None. We never initiate it. Okay. Never. Never. Okay. How do we test that? It's, it's when you are in a situation, when they have come into your space. For instance, I'm conducting deliverance. Okay. And we've cast out several spirits. That I know from experience that there's usually an impersonator. Okay. And that spirit of impersonation is there to confuse the deliverance minister. And what they do is they act out, they act out the freedom that comes from deliverance. So you see something like, oh, praise God. Praise God, I'm free, I'm free. Thank God, I'm free, I'm free. The experienced deliverance minister will think that individual is free, but it could be an impersonator. Satan has no problem saying, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, I'm free. He has no problem saying all those words, but the Bible tells us that he has a problem saying that Jesus came in the flesh. So for me, every time I conduct deliverance, I'm going to compare, I'm going to, uh, require, not compel, require that individual to confess after me. And okay. I will say, I am free. I believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. If a demon is remaining there, they won't say it. Okay, now I understand. That's how it works. We never engage them first because they are liars. They, they, when they speak lies, they speak their native language. So if I say I want to engage a spirit, a demonic spirit, it might manifest as uh, demon A. Meanwhile, it's demon W. Okay. They lie. So we never engage them. But if they cross the line, then we stop them in the name of Jesus. And to help the person we're praying for, we ensure that we don't leave any behind. Because if you leave, the Bible says when they leave, Matthew chapter 12, they go and walk in the dry, arid places of the earth not finding rest, they say to themselves, I'm going back to my house where I came from. They have the audacity to think the body of the person is their house. And then they come, they find the house, they find the house clean. They don't come in. They go and look for seven demons, more wicked than themselves. And then they come into the person and the condition of that person is worse than before the deliverance ministration. That's why you don't do deliverance for unbelievers. Because okay. if you do deliverance for an unbeliever, you make the situation worse. So that's how, that's how and why we test those spirits to ensure that the person is truly free. Oh, that oh God, thank God, they'll be weeping. They cry, I'm free. I'm finally free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, this. Thank you, that. All right. Let's pray together. Father, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, say after me. I will word into the prayer. Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior, who came in the flesh, they will choke. Yes. And once they choke, you know there's a demon still remaining there. So you continue the ministration. Okay. So Lisa, God bless you. Good morning. Good morning. My my question may be far off topic um topic this morning, but it pertains to the Catholic religion. The house that I'm living in at the moment, it's um, 
um, full of Catholics and I have my kids doing the first communion class, which will be graduating, I think the 29th of April from that. Can you explain more on, maybe give a little um, review on the Catholic religion, if I'm making the right step in placing them into the Catholic religion, having them baptized and everything there. Because I'm still kind of... The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from about verse, let me say 10 or 11, on down, it says the spiritual man judges all things, yet he is judged of no man. I will say the things I want to say in light of the scriptures. So I, I do not want to be seen as judging the Catholic faith. There are, things that, there are things that they do that's inconsistent with scriptures. And mm -hmm. those things that they do that's inconsistent with scriptures are grave enough for me to question every other thing that they do. Okay. You understand? I went to Catholic yeah. school. I went to Catholic school and for, for five years, uh, high school in Nigeria, I was in the Catholic church. I was the school organist. I played organist, the organ at mass and all that. I served. I almost okay. converted from Methodism to Catholicism, jumping from fire to fire. Anyway, the point is, if I see anything that they do that's inconsistent with scripture, then I question everything else that they do. For instance, the Bible is clear, that shall have no graven image. It's a command. Yes. You walk into the Catholic church, it's full of graven images. How do you explain that? What are you doing with the rosary? What does the rosary do? It doesn't face the devil. It's not the rosary yes. that works when Catholics pray. It's their faith and their belief that works. The Bible says all things are possible to him. Who believes? It's not the rosary. It's the belief of that individual that brings their prayer to, to uh, you know, to, uh, gives answer to yeah. Right? Holy Communion for little children. Do they understand what Holy Communion is? According to the scripture, baptism is an outward expression of a work of grace that God has done inside you. What is that work of grace? Salvation. His grace reached me when I was 17 and showed me that even though I was born in a Christian home, both parents, grandparents, ministers, that was not enough guaranteeing me a place in heaven. I needed to be born again. And I gave my life to Jesus. That's the inward work of grace that the Holy Spirit did that pushed me to salvation. Now, to say to the whole world, I have given my life to Jesus. I go and get baptized in the water. Because 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tells us that when I am dipped in the water, dipped, not sprinkled upon, yeah. I identify with Jesus Christ's burial. So baptism is burial in one sense. And when I'm pulled out of the water, I identify with his resurrection. That's what baptism is. Okay. So you're baptizing a seven-year-old. Does he understand what he's doing? Or is it a sacrament of the church? Of the Catholic Church? What is a sacrament? There's nothing like that in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about the six basic doctrines of the Christian faith. Those are the doctrines we adhere to because that's what the word says. Not some committee somewhere or some group of people somewhere who say this is how we want to conduct our worship. The Bible is the final arbiter in all matters of faith and belief. And there's okay. so many Can things. Still... What, what is the purpose of stations of the cross? What does he do? <laughs> I don't know. You used to do all those things. You genuflect, you do in the name of the Father. You say, hey, Mary, you say, our Father, hey. Satan is just laughing. Laughing. Look at what the Pope is doing now. Yeah, and I've been looking at some um, videos. I think recently I saw one with the upside it don't cross that the, the Catholics um, are making before they say their prayer. So, and I was coming upon um, some videos recently as well, 
that was speaking about it. So that kind of had me second guessing having my kids, you know, go through that. Go to the Lord, you're born again, you have his spirit now. Tell him, Father, speak to me. You gave me these children. I cannot afford not to lead them to you. Show me how. Yeah. And let the spirit of God speak to you. Okay, then. Thank you. You're welcome. Christine. I had to write it down. So you brought us to Daniel's. Oh, thank you, by the way. Um, you brought us to Daniel 7. Uh, Daniel 11. Sorry, Daniel 11, 37. It says, he will have no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women. And you said he was probably raised in a Jewish descent. And so my question is, um, going back to angels, are the angels men? Are all angels men? And I think, in, I think the question is, are all angels male? male okay all angels male and in the human production in human production the seed comes from the man yes. and so what if is are there still fallen angels doing the same thing in ancient times that they are doing now no because god gathered all of them bound them up in chains and they are kept in everlasting darkness awaiting judgment. Perfect, thank you. Yes, and all spirits are male. Okay. God, God is the father of all spirits. I think it's Ephesians 3 that, that tells us that. Let me give you that reference. He's the father of all spirits. He presents as male, and therefore all spirits are male. My spirit is male, your spirit is male. That's God the sons put, of God. God just put it in a female body. Okay. My spirit is not my body. Right, because it's just my body. If I come out of it, it's going to drop to the ground lifeless. They're not the same. My spirit is made in the image and likeness of God. God put it in a body. It happens to be a female body because my dad gave my mom an X chromosome. Right. See? But all spirits are male because God is the father of all spirits and God presents as male. Okay. So that scripture, let me give you the references. I think it's Ephesians 3. If I'm not mistaken. It says God is the father of all spirits. It's one of Paul's prayers. Let me Google it. I can't find it. I think it's Hebrews 12, 9. I'm, I'm looking at that. It's not what I'm looking at. But Hebrews 12, 9 will do. It does mention it. Uh, Hebrews 12, 9. It says, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Are we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? That, that will do. But I know it's also mentioned somewhere in Ephesians. So okay. the God who is father of all spirit is spirit, is spirit, John 24. God is spirit. And because he presents as male, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. His name shall be called. Because he presents as male, our spirits are male. But our spirits reside in different uh, bodies, male body, female body, depending on what your dad did. Okay, uh, I have a second part to that. 
So talking about relationships, when someone has the spirit of God, but they get into a relationship because they don't have a, the gift of discernment and they get into a relationship with somebody who doesn't um, and they have a child. And the, the man is the one who is not of. Not saved. Not saved. What that's, happens to the spirit of the child? That seed. First, first Corinthians 7. The Bible says in verse 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not. And if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. Okay. So the children that they have will be sanctified. Okay. It says, else were your children unclean, but now they are holy because the wife is sanctified. The husband and the children are sanctified. Okay. And then my last one was, I doesn't have any you talked about it at the event in new jersey after we got together the, we I, there was a few women that were praying before the event for a couple weeks we got together after the day after on monday and both of us women had the discernment that there was a witch there and so we did pray against that witch. Um, I felt the presence of the witch there that day. But I didn't do anything about it because I wanted to be um, respectful and proper. But the Lord convicted me and said, well, why didn't you do something about it? But I did nothing. Having that discernment where we're talking about in the in Revelation with all of this stuff that's going on, how do you pray about that when you feel it without disrespecting the the event? The scripture came to my mind just as as you were talking, uh, which is the answer to what you're asking me. But then it escaped my mind again. I hope it comes back to me. But first of all. If you perceive the presence of a witch in the place, that's a gift from the Holy Spirit at work in your life. And he didn't show you so that you can be silent. I was convicted on uh, Monday. Yeah. yeah, you need to repent for not being bold. That's number one. Number two, it's a spiritual matter. You won't disrupt the service. You deal with it in the spirit. The Bible says, gotcha. thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Don't, please put that scripture up. You challenge that spirit in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you render them powerless. Job 5.12, God is the devices of the craft such that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. Whatever they came to that meeting for, they will not be able to accomplish it. That's number one. Two, Jesus, God was hanging out with his sons, the angels, Job chapter one. Satan came in the midst of them. And God said, what are you doing here? Ah, I've been running up and down the earth. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? So that may have been what was going on too. You see what I'm saying? So it's either a boldness will arise in your heart to check that spirit, bind the spirit, and drive it out of the place. Or God allowed that clown to come there because... God is asking the same question of any one of us that was there. Or they came there with the full intent to wreak havoc and the, the palpable anointing of that weekend just tied them up and they couldn't do whatever they wanted to do. Either way, the body of Christ came up victorious. Thank you. Thank you. God. I can't remember the scripture that came to me. Ah. But I hope what I said helped you. It did. Thank you. Praise God.
Steve, your hand is up. Hi, good morning, Pastor Mo. Uh, I'll take Tracy after you and we'll be done. It's 11, 18. Okay, so my question is about your situation this morning about like the dizziness, right? It was like dizziness. Mm -hmm. I had the same thing happen to me and it still happens to me. When in high school, uh, before I had cancer, I had these dizzy spells to the point where I would go to move and then I would like, my eyes would go black. I would sort of have control, but then I would fall back down and I literally fell on my face once. And I had like, like rug burn on my face once and then it happened more than once where I fell. But then after I went and got tested and I went, they told me there was nothing wrong with me. I was like, what do you mean? Like there's even proof. I had, I had I had my grandpa witness me falling as I was walking towards him to go out to eat or whatever. I had my dad see me get up from a couch once and I fell back to where I was. There was one time I got off my bed and I fell straight onto my floor. And um, it was it was weird because they could never explain it medically. I had heart monitors, I had brainwave tests, I had all kinds of stuff and it makes me think that if you're saying that it was demonic, that 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 could be one of the cases that I'm suffering from. Is it something that's still ongoing? Well, I I can. The last time I remember, I was dizzy. It, it I haven't passed out anymore because I know that once I get like that, to just hold on to something and then wait for it to pass. Because that's what it could be a medical condition, and I would I would uh, strongly urge that you look into it. Um, I I don't know I don't know the reason for it. Um, for me personally, issues concerning my health is forever settled. Right. The enemy can only try. See, because all the thoughts that came to me, all right, sit back down, lay down. It will clear. I was thinking those thoughts. At the same time, I was speaking the word. But my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Sickness and oppression is far from me. I have to go step too much in the Lord for me to not lay up in one bed and people come and visit me that I'm not well. It's not going to happen. I was saying all of that. At the same time, my mind was telling me, okay, lay down. Okay, hold on to this. Okay, hold on to that. Go call your cousin to take the kid to school and all that. And I said, no. I teach these things every day. I will do the exact opposite. You. you know, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes I think that might be my flesh telling me that's not what I'm doing because I'm doing the right thing. But I don't know. The the, the truth of the matter is I'm I'm too stubborn and I think Satan knows. He, he just he said, let me try, maybe I'll catch on off guard. He missed it. Mm -hmm. Be sober, oh. be vigilant. Okay. And I also wanted to mention that uh, you mentioning that uh, the Antichrist was homosexual kind of gave me a relief because I love women, but in a... <laughs> oh, you're not the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> You're too funny, Steve. Hey, I had to say it. <laughs> Thank you. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Can y'all still see me? Yes. Yes. My screen went blank. I can't see anybody. Yeah, Mr. Molo. Did you hear Jay? I think now she's frozen. That screen's frozen. That's the AI. <laughs> Chi -chi. <laughs> I'm sorry. Who was that? I bet Dawn said that. Oh I'm sorry, God. government. I'm sorry. You know I'm childish. I'm sorry. Chi Chi, that was you. <laughs> I 
Pass them all back. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my uh, my laptop just went blank, so I'm on my uh, I'm on my phone. All right, Tracy, your hand is up. Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm sitting in the dark, so you won't be able to see me even if I put my uh, my uh, video on. Hi, everyone. Hi, Pastor Mo. Hello. Uh, it's great to be here because I'm not able to attend because of the load shedding. I'm not able to attend every day, but man, it's just been such a pleasure to be a part of this Bible study, um, growing, growing every single day. Uh, Christine, I would just like to say I had a similar experience about yesterday, a week ago. No, sorry, on Sunday, a week ago, I called Pastor Mo at around 4.45 in the morning. I was um, at a church that I don't normally go to. And um, long story short, I God basically showed me like a movie that the guest speaker that was at that church was not a man of God. And he started calling out people so that he could lay hands on them and pray for them. And I knew before he said that, I said to my mother was standing next to me because we were, we were at a church of her friends. Um, I asked her, is this something that normally happens in this church? And she said, well, no, I don't know, not really, because she also doesn't frequent the church. And I knew that he was going to call me out because I said to her that if he calls me out to lay hands on me, I'm not going to go. There were about 150, maybe 200 people in the church. And just like God showed me, he called me out and to lay hands on me and to pray for me. Someone had brought him anointing oil supposedly and some he had given someone that he prayed for water that he just babbled over. But I knew in my spirit that that was not a man of God. And a boldness arose inside of me when he pointed at me and the usher came to lead me to the front. I said, no, I waved my finger towards him. I said, no. And he obviously was shocked. Everyone else was shocked. I took my bag and I walked out. The pastor of the church came out. Ashes came out rushing after me. My mother came out. Obviously, this was something that had never happened. But I say this to say to you that, number one, you're in the right place. You're in the right fellowship. The anointing, the boldness of the woman of God that is teaching us here through the spirit of God is working. And when those moments come, these are the times where we need to stand up as soldiers of God to tell the devil, not here, go next door. So I pray that next time it happens, you have the boldness to say to the devil, go next door, not here. And then I have a question with regards to deliverance. Um, I know that so at times, Pastor Mo, when, we, when a, a person gets delivered uh, from a particular demon, you, they continue to battle with uh, thoughts that they would have had. Um, and earlier you said that when you deliver somebody you and the person, for you to check whether they are delivered or not, they won't be able to say that Jesus came in the flesh right so once a person is delivered and that strong hold is still there that represents itself in thoughts and maybe actions of the individual what would then be an indicator that um, and I'm saying fully delivered loosely what would then be an indication that they are fully delivered would it be a change in behavior and those desires and thoughts not being there or not I'm complete. No, Thank you. Not, not necessarily, because we have a formidable adversary. Not to big him up or anything. The truth of the matter is he is unrelenting. All right? Mm. What deliverance does is remove the compulsion. Because mm. when there's demonic oppression, it's, it, there's a compulsiveness to whatever that, that uh, um, hook let me use the word hook. Mm -hmm. What that hook is, whatever the person is hooked to, sexual addiction, uh, smoking, whatever the problem is, 
if there is a demonic possession, it's a compulsion that they almost cannot help themselves. So what deliverance will do is remove that component where a spirit is prevailing upon you and it's almost like you cannot help yourself. All right, so all the demons are gone. The house is clean. The Bible says, fill the house back up so that when that devil comes back, he's not going to find it empty and say it's coming back in there. How do you fill the house up? You fill it up with the word of God. You hmm. begin to practice righteousness. You hold yourself accountable to someone that you know you're safe with and will continue to hmm. stand with you, with you, counsel you, fight with you, pray with you. See what I'm saying? Because hmm. once the demons leave, you become like any other Christian that's not demonized. Hmm. And every Christian struggle with thoughts because that's hmm. how the comes. Mm. show up in your living room or your bedroom he comes with a thought mm. or a word mm. you know, went to Eve and said did God really say mm. he God said and he knew Eve heard God but he went to question the word and that's what the enemy does in our life he comes to question the word mm. I'm fired and I don't know when I'm going to get another job I don't know how I'm going to cope with my bills it's a word that the enemy puts in my heart. How are you going to cope? Now you've lost your job. Hmm. It's a word he always puts. I have the right to respond to him. My God is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God, my provider. My Amen. job was provider in the first instance. Hmm. What do you think he's going to say after that? He's going to leave me alone. Hmm. So when, you, when the demonic influence is removed, you are... You are reset to who you ought to be in Christ. But then you still mm. have the challenge of the thoughts. That's why mm. 2 Corinthians says, cast down every thought and bring it to the obedience of Christ. Amen. Your body is dead. The flesh is dead. There's no good thing in the flesh. It's decaying. Your spirit is brand spanking new, made after the image and likeness of God. The battle of every child of God is in the uh, soulish realm, your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect, and your imagination. That's where we wage the war. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Father, we thank you for your word. It is eternal. It is unchanging because you are unchanging. We give you glory and honor for the truths that we are learning. Our hearts are comforted knowing that you know the end from the beginning. Our hearts are doubly comforted that we are the bride of Christ and we are your sons and your daughters. And our future, our eternity is settled. Thank you, Heavenly Father, as we continue to study the book of Revelation. Those blessings that you say accrue to those who hear, who read, and who keep it. Father, let it come upon us in no small measure in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we will be careful to give you all the glory, all the praise, all the honor, and all the thanksgiving. Lord, as a body, I believe by the fellowship, we bring Sunday before you. That's the day we celebrate our anniversary and the wonderful things that you have done for us in one short calendar year. You are an awesome God. We commit that day into your hands, everyone that's handling whatever part of all of the arrangements. There are many moving parts. Lord, that the spirit of excellence will rest upon them, that your hand will guide them, decisions that they need to make, persons that they need to see, where they need to go. We speak divine protection over them. Many are flying in. We know that Don is in Houston already. I believe Angela is in Houston already. Thank you for having kept them. For as many as are on the way, uh, Kathy is in flight. For as many as are on the way, those who will take off today, tomorrow, uh, Saturday, Lord, because Jesus is Lord over the heavens, we declare that the heavens are safe and all airways are made safe for them. Because he's Lord on the earth, we declare that their travel by land is safe for all those that are traveling by road in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We give you glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Let's do Job 5.12 and dismiss. Father, thank you. Your word is sure. We speak it with boldness and clarity. We speak to the north. 
you disappoint you speak to the south you disappoint lord we speak to the east you enterprise speak to the west you they cannot perform it was Jesus name we have spoken and thus it shall be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ amen Amen. 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 Tomorrow is Friday. Am I right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Tomorrow is when we pray. I want to encourage you to come. Prayer is where you co-govern this earth with God. It says you are kings and priests unto him. King of where? King of the kingdom of Stephen. King of the kingdom of Christian. King of the kingdom of Abby. King of the kingdom of Veronica. Come and establish what goes in the kingdom he has given you to govern. Your mind, your body, your spirit, your will. He's giving you power to self-govern. It's in the place of prayer that you root out, you pull out, you throw out, you destroy. And then you establish what he has to say, not what the devil wants to do. So come tomorrow ready to pray. And uh, we will also be interceding for Sunday. Uh, God will give us an awesome time of rejoicing in his presence. We are anticipating more miracles, more deliverances on that day in the name of Jesus Christ. So we'll see you tomorrow in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.